Uh, today I'm going to talk about how to come up with um, vision and idea for your game and how to execute it. Everything is uh, based on my personal experience and um, years of work in game development. So I um, uh, started work in, in game dev in 2008 uh, and uh, I started my own studio in 2010. And I started my own studio when I saw uh, the game called Mystery Case Files Return to Ravenhurst. It was a mystery um, adventure game with puzzles and exploration and story and ghosts. And I saw that game and I thought, oh, I want to make a game like that. And um, uh, I put together a small team uh, formed from my uh, ex-colleagues. And we made a first demo, showed it to Big Fish. They liked it, and they started funding the studio, and that's how we got started. And we've been working with them for about seven, eight years, doing content exclusively for them, and all those games were mystery adventure, uh, puzzle adventure, hypnotic games. We made about 25 games over seven years and released them. It's pretty um, high volume. At some point, we were doing six games at a time, uh, which for 30-ish uh, people studio is quite a lot, but um, we ran top production, and I'm going to talk later about it, how we did it. Uh, so a lot of this process that I'm going to uh, elaborate on is based on that. And uh, a couple years ago, we switched to more um, virtual reality and exploring in the mobile space. We just recently launched our first VR game, Witch and Tower VR. And the process we created doing um, puzzle adventure games worked perfectly making that game. And it also worked on all the mobile games. And um, one of our experiments, we launched a game called Send Around Among the Woods. It's purely text-based adventure game, like choose your own adventure, but with some mm -hmm. twists. Uh, so overall, Daily Magic specializes in adver adventure games in like any form. And I'm a CEO and founder, but my day-to-day -day job is uh, producing, uh, overseeing game design. I do a lot of pitches for different publishers. Uh, and of course, I do operations. Uh, I look what is going on in our finances and uh, operations in general. So that's who I am. And this is uh, a bigger image of the game I was talking about, which is our VR. You got some awards. Uh, we uh, have it on HTC Vive, Oculus, and now porting to PlayStation uh, VR. And uh, it was a big step for our studio because we transitioned from 2D uh, art production to 3D. And uh, everybody in the studio learned it from scratch. Like we didn't, we have only one 3D artist on staff, and he kind of taught everybody else. Um, so we we'll start with um, creating initial vision and you guys probably know how to do that but um, this is like my twist on it <laughs> so um, you need to uh, figure out what the game is about so very minimal story in a very basic language uh, gameplay features and you need to think about it like that the player will be playing uh, will be doing something most of the time and you need to figure out what it is and also be able to explain it to a non-gamer, to a, uh, essentially a person who never played the game. Um, you need to think about why, um, oh wait, I want to show you a video, one second. Yeah, so the video about Vision Tower, sorry about that. It was a bad transition. Oops. <laughs> they say. Happy is the head that wears the crown. <laughs> I forgot you guys were on split. I'm sorry. I wouldn't have pointed that out. Okay. I apologize. Um, so we'll move over here. Alright. They say, Happy is the head that wears the crown. Perhaps. But 
when weighed against its power, I fear it not. And it is with this power that I will protect my kingdom. How far must I be willing to go to do so? How far is too far? I pay no mind to such questions. Many will question me, question my methods. I simply do not care. For once they see what I have done, they will tremble at the sight. None shall oppose me. I will be without equal. I will protect my kingdom. Protected from you. kind of gives you an idea of what type of stuff we're into so we like all this dark mystery um, environments uh, a lot of glowy blue things um, skeletons fighting uh, puzzles of course um, and back to creating a vision for a um, game like that um, so where we were um, yeah so the you need to figure out gameplay features and uh, for example in the wishing tower the main features were melee combat and puzzles so you solve puzzles and you fight with sword and shield this is on the very basic level what this game is about uh, but of course to like say it to somebody else you need to put your marketing language on it um, and you need to say something VR meets zombie apocalypse and stuff like that um, you need to figure out what kind of players uh, will be excited so a lot of uh, people try to come up with like gender or age or stuff like that essentially what matters is what kind of fun players want and you need to think about that from that angle um you need to find a few game references that the game is the closest to so for witching tower uh our main two references was Elder Scrolls Skyrim and Dark Souls 3, and for the puzzle aspect of it, we were looking at Adventure Realms for VR. So we were constantly looking at those games, uh, pulling out features, and mo modifying them, and um, that's how vision for like 60% of the game was created. Um, important thing is um, the time aspect of it, uh, because it's uh, the time you have limits you to what you can do it mostly limits you to amount of content so how many locations or levels or actual content you can um, create because essentially a lot of features can be done within one or two months and it can work on temporary art or something and uh, another question that is um, most important to me when i'm thinking about uh, creating a game is how big is the world uh, how open is the world because it dictates a lot of technical limitations as well and uh, second thing that um, you need to think about is what the genre and setting so I'm going to talk about look and feel like first half of my presentation and then I'm going to move more to production specifics so genre and setting, um, genre these days doesn't really exist in like very clear form. It's usually a hybrid of action adventure, uh, 
puzzle adventure, shooter uh, puzzle, stuff like that. And um, setting is um, also there's very vague standards these days, but uh, you need to think about how you want the game to look and where where is it happening. Um, like my favorite settings are 60s Americana or Victorian, um, like 1800s. That's um, like how I came up with most of those games we made for Big Fish because I really like those buildings and um, little uh, small towns with Victorian buildings. And um, when you try to figure out the setting, the question is, how, what do you imagine when you think about your game and when you want other people to imagine what images you want to trigger in their head. Uh, and few uh, tips what's, what looks good and what doesn't require a lot of time for artists. Uh, it's anything in the dark uh, with rain or snow, it looks really good and um, it's not very expensive in production. Anything low poly, and I call it dreamy, like Monument Valley. Uh, it looks very stylish, it, it aesthetically, um, um, it's like an eye candy, and it's also not very expensive as long as the artists get the vision right and get a re uh, good mood board. Uh, pretty much anybody can pull it off. And glowy stuff always looks, um, looks pretty, uh, like, like high production value, like Beat Saber. Um, and anything glowy makes the game look expensive. So this is like internal kind of stuff, but you usually you never tell it to actual players. Mariana, when you say a, a, an asset is expensive, like you're really talking about time, right? Is that yeah, I'm talking about time and amount of people involved. So like for the, um, like a really good 3D environment, it, it's, it can take, weeks of like five people working full time on one location or something and uh with like something glowy and even in 3d it can be done in three days okay another um step um, in, in the very beginning of creating a vision is a mood board do you guys make mood boards when you okay so <laughs> no surprise there Okay, uh, and you know how to make them, right? How, can you, somebody tell me how you create a mood board? Super, super. Mm -hmm. You essentially go out and look for images or references that are close to what you would envision it is. Find the best ones, put them together in a document. You'll probably add notes for like more specific things in case somebody other than you is interested in the mood board. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. What's your name? James. James. And you, uh, this mood board you're talking about for like specific asset or for the whole game? Uh, usually for a specific asset. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, how you do it. Uh, I make mood boards for the whole game uh, and I put them in the pitch for the publisher. Even though it's just, you know, images from the internet, uh, which I have no copyright uh, whatsoever, but it just sets the mood uh, for people to understand what I'm talking about. And even if it's like a big, you know, six-hour game, and it's going to take years in production, I still need to kind of show what I what I got. And to create all these concepts, it can take like three weeks um, minimum. So, but when I show mood board, everybody's like, "Oh yeah, yeah, this, yeah, sci-fi, okay." And um, after you create a mood board and like imagine your look and feel, uh, you need to get into more specifics and uh, based on like reading reviews from players for our games and um, also critiques and what people post uh, on like websites, uh, like upload VR, VR focus or um, all those gaming forums. Um, what they really want to know and um, what you need to think about initially. Uh, of course, a platform you're developing because everybody wants to know, do I have that uh, device? Or if you're creating a game just for demonstration, 
you need to think about that you're gonna send it to like at least 50 people and you need to figure out what they have so it seems very obvious but it's um, for us we that's why we chose Vive and we just knew that everybody has it and all their kids have it so um, that's how we came up with that uh, you need to know controls you need to because players also um, what they talk about on forums is uh, how complicated is it they share tips and tricks and it's very important and also essentially it's important to talk about on like social networks and how you communicate your game uh, because people want to know how to operate it and um, most importantly it's uh, how long is the game that's number one thing uh, players comment on and it and um, they want to know if it's worth their time and if it's worth their money um, and we even when we released the smallest game that game I, I was talking about center on the woods it cost two dollars to buy that game and even for that a lot of players uh, were complaining about it it was six solid six hour game good production value but a lot of players were offended they were asked to pay two dollars even though it's like a half a cup of coffee at starbucks but people still um very particular about it and um the length of the game will determine how much uh, assets you're gonna need how much time you're gonna spend on level design and um, the whole production pipeline And if you do like Google search on game length or like any game, the first thing that will pop up will be how long is it? And if it's worth even the smallest amount of money. Uh, another thing that I want to know is um, when they look at it, they need, to, they need to feel cool about playing that game. So on the visual level, regardless of the genre or production value or whatever, they need to see if it aligns with their coolness. That's kind of how I determine it. And that's why we do a lot of this bluish environments, especially for more of a hardcore gamers. And another thing people want to know if it's the game is social and if it's replayable, because of replayability also dictates the value of the game, and the um, and the social thing, um, that's how people connect these days. Um, and the most important question is, what kind of impression do you want this game to make on other people? And the main people you need to care about is the influencers. It's um, also a pretty recent trend. Uh, so, and how you figure it out? You just look at the games that are very similar, and you look how uh, streamers and YouTubers describe them. Um, and it's also pretty simple. You don't need any tools for that. And uh, if you do enough research, you see that they use like two or three line sentences to describe literally any game. And essentially, this two or three sentences is your high level vision of that game, which you create in the very beginning. Uh, do you have any questions so far about anything? Yes? Uh, it's called Sender Unknown The Woods. It's that game um, I was talking about that uh, is text-based. Uh, I have a screenshot some, somewhere. So this is uh, how the game looks. So this is choose your own adventure. So the so you're the your character and somebody's talking to you on your phone and you need to choose one of three options to reply. And that like kind of branches out and you can get different endings, different situations so that that's the game and that's a very standard price point for a game like that yeah 
Yeah, it is. <laughs> but it, it was received pretty well, and it was featured on App Store. So the game was successful. It's just like us analyzing all the reviews we got, that like how many people actually pointed it out, the $2 price point. So yeah, that was kind of weird. It's on the App Store. Yeah. What's it called again? Center Unknown, The Woods. Yeah, it was a very fun project. It was very short. It was like overall like three, four months production time to complete this. It was a very small team, like three people full time on that project. Uh, and we worked with a professional writer to, to develop that game. So uh, sh uh, her name is Lisa Burnett. Uh, she wrote the script and we came up with all this interface and stuff and we added stats. And stats is no surprise for like old school RPGs, but for all this new choose early adventure, we were kind of first who did that. And um, a lot of players like that. And we got overall positive reviews and uh, we got featured. Uh, and it was just a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun we, because we um, usually we don't have a writer on staff and we write all the stories ourselves and you know, dialogues, but this was the first time we were working with professional and it was so much easier because she can just write pages of text in like a week. Yes? Uh, what year was it released? It was released uh, 2017. Okay. Yes. Uh, how, long it, how long was development and did you folks make it possible? Like in the very beginning, first time? Mm -hmm. How long did it take to make the game, and then did you folks make a net profit with that $2 uh, price point? Oh, for this game? Yes. Uh, so it took about three or four months to uh, create a game with three people team, and we made a profit about uh, four months after release. Uh, after everything rolled in, then we got featured, then was some sale, so it was like the uh, process. Yes? Is that um, more? Is that more or less like how long it usually takes for some of your games, or was that? No, this is a very small project. So the the game I showed you the video, right, the Witching Tower, that took a year to make, yeah, and and much bigger team, like twelve people team. Yeah. Right. Yes. Um. So Ravenhurst is personally one of my favorite childhood games. Nice. So what part of that inspired you? So I really looked that it's basically a movie, but it's interactive and all this like puzzles and quests that were in the game were very tied to the story. And, um, and the story itself was pretty good. And it was uh, back then it was very high production value for a casual game. So that's what got me very inspired. Anyone else? Yes. My favorite project? Uh, my favorite project. Good question. <laughs> uh, I'd say uh, Sable Maze 12 Fears. It was released in 2015, I think. It was one of those games for Big Fish. And um, that game uh, is also like puzzle adventure, pretty dark stuff. Uh, but I like that we. Uh, came up with those 12 fears and the game was structured so like each, each segment is one fear and I like when things are structured and that game was um, really um, like atmospheric uh, with all the fear uh, stuff and but structured at the same time so that's why I like it. Um, what was your part in that? My part in that one I did an initial concept so I did like the pitch and the vision and I handed it to a designer and then I was producing the game. So in my uh, case, producing means get the game built every week or two weeks and write a feedback. Uh, and feedback sometimes um, is just things that I noticed and that needs to be fixed. And sometimes it's much bigger stuff when I say, okay, we need to add the cutscene here. Here's a storyboard. Here's a dialogue. Uh, here's the new quest we need to add. So more like... Um, creative stuff, but um, that's what producing means. And at the very end, when it's like close to beta, I really watch the schedule, uh, even though 
other people watch it too, but I like double watch it. Yes? So earlier in the presentation, you mentioned that uh, part of your job is then to make pitches mm -hmm. for new games. Yeah. What do you do to prepare for the pitch? Uh, like when I say it? Yeah. Or how, like, how, do you, how do you prepare? Uh, so that's what I do. I create a mood board and stuff, <laughs> and uh, I try to answer those questions. I, I say because I know how she's gonna ask about it. How she's gonna ask how long is the game, what platform, blah blah blah, um, target audience. The it's um, very standard checklist, and uh, I also try to uh, that thing that is different. Why the game stands out. That's also like number one question everybody is going to, going to ask, and this you know everybody trying to make like a shooter or something, but it's very hard to make a shooter that's different from anybody else. Um, so what else do I do? So I I do that and I also practice uh, things what we're good at as a studio. So uh, most successful pitches were done when I was specifically talking about adventure or, uh, design and storytelling and stuff like that and what kind of you know environments and uh, graphics we're good at and when I say that then I say what why game is different and it's successful. Yes? Uh, I imagine that before you would be making pitches and big pitches, is that right? And before you making so these days we talk to a lot of uh, people in VR industry, so especially like HTC would be one of them. Right now we're working on a pitch for um, uh, Burj Khalifa Tower in Dubai. This is very random, but they want to make a VR game based on their tower, and then we're pitching to them. And uh, a lot of mobile publishers, like when we were experimenting with mobile, and we still do, we pitch to a bunch of people like uh, Gem City, Scopely, um, everybody who uh, publishes mobile games. Welcome. Yes? With user interface? Yes. Yes, uh, so with, in 2D game, right, you can do pretty much whatever you want. You can place your UI uh, around the screen and nobody's going to be offended. But in VR, uh, you can have pretty much any UI. And what we did, uh, at first it, it was like on the bottom, but then we realized it's like super lame. So we put like a little box on player's hand. So when player click on the box, it opens up like a little inventory panel where they can um, take things and um, apply them where they want. So it was our solution. It's not great because people are still like trying to miss it and stuff like that. And that what we did with swords and armor, we, we did like a belt for the player. So it, it will feel like a natural belt and thing to reach for it. But the difficulty with that is everybody's different height and Sometimes it's like super weird and people are hurting themselves and yeah, and VR is pretty challenging because you need to you need to make it as natural as possible for a real human. Yeah. Right? Yes, that's right. Thank like, you. Yeah, how was the tr transition over from 2D to 3D? Okay, so uh, first we did a low poly demo, right, for that game which entirely they showed. It was like gray box type of stuff. Uh, we did that, everybody struggled, but they were like, okay, this looks nice. Enough. Uh, then the 3D guy that we had on staff. He kind of was teaching everybody what he knows. And then we discovered Blender. And Blender is a good tool for everybody to learn, you know, because you don't need to buy a bunch of uh, 3D Maxes or Mayas for, you know, everybody in the team. So a lot of people were um, learning how to do it in Blender. And then a few people who were uh, very into it picked up on 3D Max and Maya. And then 
some of our 2D artists, they transitioned into texture artists, and also they like watched some YouTube videos, figured out how to do it, and um, and then, like, on a very high level, that was the process. It's probably from the moment we started to kind of learn it for 3D models to look like this. It was maybe, like, five months, I'd say. And, like, the final textures we were um, making, like, by the very end of the production of that game. So it, it finally came together, like, within a year from when we started that learning process. Yes? How did the programmer tell us? Uh, so, uh, the programmers, uh, so they essentially had to learn Unreal Engine from scratch, which we never, nobody um, knew about it. And uh, we were working with Cocos 2DX, and uh, it was a very stable process. Everybody knew how to do, do what, and, uh, you know, when you make 20-ish games in that same engine, you don't really write too much code on top of it. It's mostly just scripts, because it's just changing the the content. So they, they needed to learn Unreal from scratch and same stuff, YouTube videos, whatever, tutorials. Uh, and the funny thing is, in the beginning, they're like, no, we can't do it. We, it it's gonna, it's not gonna work. No, I'm like, learned this my whole life. But then it just takes maybe a couple of weeks to start and just say, okay, there's no choice. You either do it or no. <laughs> and then, <laughs> Somehow they figured out. They figured, everybody do it. I, I do too. Have everything new. You, you, you don't need to be afraid of it because the game industry changes so much. Like every year, there's a new thing, new platform, new trend you need to adopt. Yeah. And yeah, and animators and artists had to learn Unreal as well. And like by the end, everybody were working inside the engine. Even though, yeah. Yes? So when you're creating a game that you know is going to bring in new things like 3D art, uh -huh. how do you decide how much time you need to give everyone to learn the whole process? We, uh, so the, all that comes down to a deadline, and we, um, so, we need to know when we when we need to have a first playable. So first playable is essentially the game build where you can do something and it looks kind of like a game and there's some environments. And for like the game we already know how to make, it's very, uh, it's like three weeks. But for something new, uh, we it's like a little art and science and we would give a couple months for that. But the goal is to have something working uh, it doesn't need to look good by a certain amount, a certain date, and people know that. And even if they don't know the program or the skill or whatever, just having that in their head kind of started the gears rolling, you know. And if the person is knows something already, like any program, they can learn another program. I mean, on high levels, how it works. <laughs> yes. So I'm going to turn off the question that you asked last week. Okay. Um, so during the process of which there's a transition for all of the entire team, um, did you feel like some people suffered from imposter syndrome and had to pass that? A which syndrome? Uh, imposter syndrome. Imposter? I, I saw it. It's where someone like, they kind of know how to do it, but they don't have faith in how to do it. You don't have faith, okay. Is that the last description? Yeah, so, um, yeah, this, um, I mean, during that transition, that didn't really happen because it, it all depends on project manager and the leader. And if they kind of communicated, like, it's okay, we can all learn, we're smart, <laughs> it's going to be fine. And uh, people just do it. And, like, with us, we use some psychological tricks. Uh, we essentially pretended like it's not a big deal. Like, okay, I made 25 2D games, we make 3D, no problem. 
So it's just a matter of you know attitude and how you how you is deliver it. Like if we will call it meeting and say, oh my god, guys, we need to make 3D game. Jesus Christ! Like people freak out. <laughs> but we were just like, okay, now we're doing this. Great. Everybody's like, yes. <laughs> so, but yeah, of course, everybody struggles. But it's um, when you set the mood right, then things start happening. Welcome. Okay. Uh, other questions for now? Yes. Uh, visual effects. So um, we use a lot of particles. Um, so uh, we, um, you mean like the tool set or what? So uh, I can like explain it in uh, like non-technical language. <laughs> so uh, in VR, what really works is uh, all kinds of particles and all kinds of like dust or glowing uh, like lines so uh, and it's also pretty cheap to do uh, and in VR is, is specifically all the environment needs to respond so anything you touch or interact with need to give you some kind of uh, visual feedback in visual effects uh, and uh, the challenging thing for like VR, you can't do cutscenes, you can't do videos, you can't do anything full screen or make the player move or look somewhere. So it all needs to be those minor touches. And uh, like, can you give me a couple examples of uh, visual effects you were thinking about? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes? Um, so you said that you liked Ravenhurst because it's kind of like a movie. Uh, do you yeah. have interest in making cinematic experiences or interactive films in VR? Yeah, we, uh, would, in, we would be interested to do it, but we are most like expertise is in um, more interactive stuff. So if it's like an, a movie where you need to do something with your hands, that will be right up our alley. But if it's just looking, then probably not. Would you have interest in like collaborating with filmmakers and things like that to make an interactive movie experience? Yes. Yes, definitely. And uh, they, there's a lot of interest and demand in that industry. Uh, I was just at the, the conference and it was m m mostly about like VR and film, and a lot of those big studios like uh, Paramount, Fox, uh, DreamWorks, they all are looking into that space. And I think they will start bringing their new IPs in VR or create like a promo movie for the main movie or something. Yes? Um, alpha, um, you mean like in uh, general or for which entire, uh, can you uh, repeat? For the alpha phase. Uh, for the alpha phase, essentially, the goal is one hour of gameplay. So one hour of uninterrupted gameplay where you can see all the features. So all the gameplay uh, is playable and there there is need to be at least for half of the time a final art uh, final environments and characters but not necessary for the whole hour so your goal is to not be embarrassed to show it at any showcase and lengthwise it's one hour of game that's like how we do it and that's how like victor's trained us to do it For you guys, uh, Vertical Slice Major Production is a little more like 15 minutes. So oh, don't, nice. So don't, don't, don't freak out over an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, a little note on production since we touched on that subject. 
So this is how we do production schedule. This is, uh, this is, you know, like agile, blah, blah, blah. But we uh, do a very simple table where we, where we do like micro milestones. So alpha essentially is broken down into like 10 micro milestones. And that's how we know that we're going to get there eventually. And um, we, we set a deadline for each micro milestone. And then when we pass it, we put a reality date. And uh, it's very important to have these two columns so nobody freaks out that there's just deadline and that's it. Everybody knows that you'll be late no matter what. Uh, and in our case, like at our best production, uh, we are late by like two, three weeks. Uh, and important thing uh, to assign responsible people for each micro milestone or people who are actually involved in producing that micro milestone. And uh, uh, surprisingly, but this process was working for us for years. And we tried to switch to, you know, that diagram where it's like different color blocks. I forgot what it's called. But that totally doesn't work. It just confuses everybody. So that's how we do it. And it, this process also works for any project. Uh, last year, I was uh, putting my house on sale, and I used exactly the same thing, and it worked. Okay, any questions about this? About the milestones? You guys, how you uh, do a production schedule? Can anybody tell me? Like when you do, when you're, you're now making your projects, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Generally, the school of management will have like sections of like um, stuff that we're learning at mm -hmm. a particular time. They want a deadline for when that project is done. Mm -hmm. And then within that, the teachers will say, okay, well, we need to have this, this milestone done by this day. Mm -hmm. And they generally do the same thing. Well, they'll make it seem pretty short. And then there's a little bit of flexibility with you can kind of push past it a little bit if you really need to, but they try to keep it set for us. So they, they kind of provide that structure. Okay, I see. Yeah, that's cool. When you will be working on your first indie game or something like that, you will, like, there should be a person who does that. And it's very good to learn it early. Um, it's very basic stuff, but it's so effective. It's just surprising. Yes? That's awesome. What, what is quads? It's a. Oh, it's um, sort of dividing up in a day into four parts. Okay. So by uh, sections of hours, and then once you finish this, you have those hours, you take a break, and you move on to the next thing that you're going to do. Then you go to lunch, then you come back, and you do the next section of hours. I see. Yeah. Nice. Thanks. Go learn something. Yeah. yeah. Packet Pack plans an online version. It's similar to Trello in a lot of uh -huh. ways. It sounds like what you were talking about. So. Yeah, I see. We tried uh, using Trello, but it's just too, like, it's everywhere and it's too confusing. <laughs> for at least for us. What we used, we used Basecamp because, like, and we, um, we do it by person. So each person kind of posts what they do every day and you can track the, the progress of that specific person and, and project manager uh, kind of see the, they can see what state of project is at any given time just by looking at it. Does anybody use Basecamp or you guys know why? Okay. Yeah, it's very good for like, for, uh, for art. 
uh, programmers usually they like Jira, they like structure, they like tasks and reproduction steps and stuff like that. But for artists uh, and animators and even designers, the Basecamp was the best for us. And we use, of course, Google Docs. We have like a tremendous amount of data on Google Docs these days because we every single thing, um, every single asset that needs to be in the game has its own document with description of that specific thing. Even for as things as big as the whole like location or even a map or a small like prop item like this thing, like the horn, like we need to do, to do a 3D horn. It's very tiny, simple thing, but we write a whole document about it because otherwise things don't get done. Um, yes? So how do you keep yourselves organized with that many assets, each having their own separate Google Doc folder? Mm -hmm. Like, um, do you have a different account for every asset or a different, like... Mm, it's um, like simple structure, like everybody have um, access to one Google folder. Then it's like separate by projects. Then inside is um, all these little things, the, these documents, we call them technical tasks. So they will go on the location technical tasks or props technical tasks or stuff like that. So it's like a huge branch of Google folders. <laughs> um, yeah, that's how we keep track of it. Of course, people get confused and they're like, oh, I wish we had this other system for it. But uh, so far, the Google Docs was the most effective and simple way to do that. Okay. Any other questions about that? Uh, we kind of got off track <laughs> on my presentation. We're going to be near the end of the talk. <laughs> Actually, we kind of took all of our questions. We can get a little stuck on time. Yeah. We have, we have a few more minutes if there's a few more things minutes. You want, okay. You Which, touch um, things or? okay. What do you want to hear about? Story, gameplay features, uh, or. UI have already covered, or level design. Level design. Level design. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They want level design. Okay. Um, okay. So level design, right? So it, uh, if we're talking about Witching Tower, what's the most important documents for level design, and how to for game designer to communicate it to level designer? In our team, it's separate people. It's different people. Level designer is more like a gameplay programmer, and game designer is a, a, you just don't have that skill. So this how we we just put a very basic map of locations and we place enemies there with dots, and this is delivered to the level designer. And initially, he or she will put it this way, and then the designer plays the game when they're placed like that. And if it doesn't feel right, they redo it. But this is like super simple, um, high level explanation how, how we do it. So like in, it depends on the engine too. Uh, so in our case, level designer work, works in blueprints. All this stuff is pretty easy to do and to change. And like even on the course of one day, they can change it like five times and uh, find the right balance. How feels interesting and fun to play. And um, in Witching Tower, there's different types of enemies and they have different powers. So uh, it's important to have the table like this. Uh, this is how it looks in our internal documents. So, and uh, because what level designer wants to know is how strong is each enemy, how they react to which type of armor, how they can move, how they cannot move, how they react to special uh, like attack, like a bomb or something, how much health they have. And this also gets balanced through the game, maybe like 30 times. Uh, do you guys do something like that for like enemies or whatever units you have in your game? Not yet. OK. <laughs> well, now. Well, now. <laughs> Yeah, but this is uh, like tables like this is very important 
for programmers and level designers, even sometimes if they don't make any sense, it's better to have them than not to have. It's a good starting point, and then you just see it in the game, and if it feels right, you change it. And um, that's also like part of the vision when you're thinking about um, what like what the game's about, what's the gameplay, blah blah blah. But very early, you need to itemize how many of which units you have in the game, how many characters, how many enemies, how many locations, uh, and you put it in a simple table, and then it's just clear for everybody what the scope of work is. Yeah, and it's like number, oh, sorry, it's all ones. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, um, itemization is very important, and uh, we have like tons of tables like this. I mean, not tons, for one game it's like maybe 10. Yes. So, for uh, for the Witch of Tower. Yes. Um, when you're designing a level and you have you, I, I assume because it's in VR, it, the moving is using like a joystick and teleport. Yeah. So, in that case, do you, when you have the player walk into a room and some enemies start pouring out to mm -hmm. come attack? Is the player locked into that room, or is there, or can they keep going? And if they can keep going, what's the incentive to do combat? Uh, yeah, it is blocked. So in which entire specifically, the, uh, because it's this puzzle adventure, it's very linear progression type game. So essentially, the design is created the way that you like clear the area, uh, but until you do it, that next door or passage or whatever is somehow blocked uh, and then when you killed everybody did all the puzzles then logically you will open that door and like door is metaphysical usually something else so yeah it's the um, pretty standard design of adventure games yes uh, I'm just curious how you went from getting your master's in journalism to becoming the CEO of a video game company and I okay. know you worked big uh, so I was uh, studying in college, right? A journalism, uh, not really my thing. I got um, what's it called? So I couldn't progress in college on my last year. I didn't pass my last exam. So I uh, uh, I was out the college, and I decided, okay, this should mean anything that I don't have my diploma or whatever. And I'm just going to go and find the best job I can find. And I went to the uh, gaming studio called Real Or Studios. Uh, I did a bunch of interviews back then. And uh, I was surprised that nobody really cared about my degree. Uh, and they were, I, I put together a portfolio. I like was creating things while I was in college and went to that interview. And uh, I really liked the company. I liked the atmosphere there, the people. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. I really want to work there. And they hired me. Uh, my first job was um, kind of like producing slash marketing. It was a very vague job description. But uh, what I was doing is I would work with, if you remember, those Flash games a long time ago. And they were distributed through across like different web portals and stuff. And I was responsible to make that game, kind of oversee that it will get done and it will look good and stuff, and distribute it on those websites. That was my very first job uh, out of college, even though I didn't graduate back then. I still went back to college two years later because of pressure on my parents, but that's the very, very start. But to CEO, so I went to Real Or Studios, then uh, I got a taste of, uh, you know, industry and stuff. I went to work for a bigger company to make more money. And then I was I saw that game that we talked about it, the Mystery Case Files, and I was like, yes, that's what I want to do. And I um, <laughs> formed a little team with my ex-colleagues, and that's how it started. And first, like, uh, if you're interested, in, like, money-wise, it was my own money. Uh, I was about to buy a car, but I decided not to do it. <laughs> and that's how I founded, like, the very first creation of the very first demo that we showed Big Fish. And then um, they started finding studio because they liked the first demo. 
Y'all, that is awesome. I think uh, we're, we're over our time a little bit, so give Mariana a hand. <laughs>